We will be recording the webinar. Hello and welcome to our NGCP national webinar, Exploring Paleontology to Spark Science Engagement from a Young Age. My name is Amanda Sullivan. I work with NGCP managing our national webinars. And I'm joined by my colleague, Nancy Scales Coddington, who you will see very actively in the chat, sharing with you useful links and resources as we are exploring this topic. Before we jump in, just a few housekeeping notes. We'd like to ask you to stay muted, but feel free to use the chat to introduce yourselves as folks have been doing, to share resources and to ask questions. We'll have a dedicated period towards the end of the webinar where you'll be able to ask your questions to our speakers and we'll go back through and see what questions were posted throughout the uh, presentation. The auto transcriptions have been enabled. If you need any help seeing the captions, please send a direct message to Nancy Scales Connington. And if you have any other questions or issues, feel free to ask us in the chat. Like I said, this webinar is being recorded. So you'll have access to the slides and all the resources as well as the chat after this presentation. So before we get started with introducing our amazing guest speakers that we have today, I wanted to provide a little bit of background on who we are at NGCP in case you're joining us for the first time. So here's our vision on screen here. We are a national network of diverse stakeholders who are advancing the agenda of gender equity. We bring together organizations that are committed to informing and encouraging girls to consider STEM. As a network of networks, our reach is broad. The programs in our network serve 20 million girls. And because many of our programs also serve boys, we reach more than around 12 million boys as well. And we've been transforming STEM for 20 years. And our vision at the heart of it is to create STEM experiences that are diverse and reflective of the world that we live in. You can see our three essential goals on screen here. We believe that STEM skills can be acquired by anyone and fostered in everyone. Our initiatives build confidence and create a community of lifelong STEM activators. Through the power of collaboration, we spark curiosity and develop a passion for STEM. We share resources and solutions with a coalition of leaders, as well as via our website, newsletters, online databases, social media, and webinars like this one. We strengthen the capacity of programs by sharing exemplary practices, research, and program models. When programs are stronger and more sustainable, girls and all youth are better served. We distribute these resources in accessible ways, such as train the trainer programs and online platforms. And we leverage our network of girls serving STEM programs, advocates, and youth so that together we can create the tipping point for gender equity in STEM. We're involved in a lot of different activities. I just want to mention a few of them, especially because many of these activities have resources and websites where you can find a lot of great free and easy to use materials. So we engage in activities virtually as well as nationally and through our local state collaboratives. We partner with organizations to scale and deliver content such as the Leap Into Science National Network in partnership with the Franklin Institute and the Million Girl Moonshot in partnership with STEM Next and the Mott After School State Networks, serving hundreds of educators via local networks. Working with Lida Hill Philanthropies, we manage the If Then Collection, which is a digital library housing photos, videos, and other media of women working in STEM fields. These media are great. There's also activities that go along with them, and they're all available freely at no cost. So definitely check out that link that Nancy is putting in the chat. NGCP also hosts a youth advisory board that reviews and provides feedback on our current initiatives, and they really are that youth voice that helps guide the future directions of our work that we do at NGCP. Fab Femmes is a national, international database of female STEM role models. They're passionate about the work they do, and they're ready to connect with programs to spark girls' interests. That's another freely free-to-use database to search for role models. And locally, our state collaborative leadership teams offer convenings and professional development, mini grants when funding is available, and they also distribute their own regular newsletters that spotlight local resources. 
If you uh, like this webinar and you're interested, um, make sure to check out our events page. We offer these monthly on a variety of different topics to help our networks grow and thrive. And the best way to find out about our webinars, our events, and other resources is to sign up for our newsletter. That is the first place where we, we share all of that content. And that brings us to today's webinar. Um, thank you for listening as I gave you a little bit of context and background on what we do at NGCP. And now I'm thrilled to turn over to the topic that brought us all here today, exploring paleontology to spark science engagement from a young age. We have three wonderful speakers who I will be introducing, and I, I can't wait for you to hear from them and hear the resources, ideas, and stories that they have to tell you. So we are joined today by Dr. Holly Woodward Ballard, who is an associate professor of anatomy and paleontology at Oklahoma State University Center for Health Sciences in Tulsa, Oklahoma. As a paleohistologist, Holly studies the microscopic structures found within fossil bone tissue to assess growth dynamics, individual variability, and survivorship in dinosaurs like Myasaurus and Tyrannosaurus. To establish a framework for such interpretations, Holly compares biological signals within the bone of modern animals to their documented life histories. In this way, when similar signals are found within fossilized bones of extinct animals, reasonable life history interpretations can be pro proposed. I'm already learning just from her, from her bio. Holly received her bachelor's degree from NC State University, her master's from Texas Tech University, and her PhD from Montana State University. She's a research associate at the Oklahoma Museum of Natural History and the Museum of the Rockies, and an honorary associate at Museums Victoria. I am so thrilled that Dr. Holly Woodward Ballard is joining us today and sharing her story, her passion for dinosaurs, and her experiences with us. We're also joined by Alyssa Barr. Alyssa has been teaching in independent schools for 15 years. This year, she combined her two passions, education and science, embarking on a new adventure as the science specialist at University Child Development School preschool through fifth grade in Seattle, Washington. Driven by the investment and engagement of her students, Alyssa can be found in the lab, exploring fossils, creating circuit puzzles, or breaking down the science behind the game of curling. In her time outside of school, she dreams of curling up with a good book, but is more often knee deep in potion making with her daughter, taking her dog on an adventure, or chipping away at a home remodel. I'm so thrilled and honored that Alyssa is here, giving us that educational perspective, those resources and ideas that we'll all be able to take with us after this webinar and put into practice with the youth that we serve. And last but certainly not least, we are joined today by Audrey O'Connell. Audrey is an experienced international museum specialist with a compelling reputation for working with all types of organizations and the creative industries to market, development, design, and operate successful and authentic exhibition products from museums, attractions, and destinations. She's a specialist in creating business opportunities for museum products and services, a useful bridge between industry sectors, and a cultural specialist for Europe, the Middle East, and Asia. Following the success of her consulting work, Audrey teamed up with former colleague and friend Jack Horner to open Horner Science Group in 2016. Having worked on several creative projects with development partners, Horner Science Group continues to drive towards delivering on the mission to galvanize adventurers of all ages to explore the vibrant and astonishing world of dinosaurs through Jack's revolutionary scientific discoveries and theories. Now, currently, Audrey is leading the production, the publication of Lily and Maya, a Dinosaur Adventure, written by Jack Horner. The goal of this book is to inspire young girls to stick to science. It's a picture book that I've read to my own young children um, who are almost three and five and a half years old. And it really is inspiring to young learners and readers who are interested in this idea of science and making discoveries and fueling their passion. So thank you so much, Audrey, for being the reason that all of us are here today to talk about Lily and Maya and paleontology. 
So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Audrey. Thank you so much, Amanda. I'm so glad your little ones uh, had fun with the book. Uh, I'm uh, so happy to be here and so pleased that the NGC project has given us the opportunity to present this webinar uh, to you today, um, exploring paleontology to spark science engagement from a young age. That's what we hope to do. Uh, joining me, of course, as you know, are Dr. Holly Woodward Ballard, um, Associate Professor of Anatomy and Paleontology at Oklahoma State. And we're also so delighted to have with us Alyssa Barr, Science Specialist for Preschool to Fifth Grades at the University Child Development School here in Seattle. Next slide, please. Uh, thank you to um, NGCP for partnering with us to share the excitement about a new children's book by Jack Horner, um, which you just heard. Uh, the paleontologist of uh, Jack is the paleontologist of both academic and Jurassic Park and world fame. Um, to put this endeavor, this book endeavor, into context for you, I'd like to give you just a little background. Um, Jack and I have known each other since our work at Montana State University's um, Museum of the Rockies uh, quite a few decades ago, uh, where he was senior curator of paleontology and I was the director of development. Jack stayed at MSU uh, until he retired from there six years ago to teach uh, in the honors program at Chapman University uh, in Orange County, California. And I moved to London in 1990 and had a long career at the Natural History Museum in London, uh, starting with the running of the touring exhibitions program for the museum, which was mostly about dinosaurs, I have to say. Jack and I stayed in touch, the theme always revolving around dinosaurs, of course. Uh, we established the Jack Horner's Dinosaurs brand to represent our values and never stop discovering, very much describes it best. Never stop discovering, be brave, and the adventure begins today. Our vision is to increase confidence in learning about the process of science and the world itself in unexpected and highly engaging ways. We believe that science must be rigorous and challenging, but it should also be fun. More specifically, we're always thinking of experiences that we can produce for kids and their families, which are scientifically grounded and also awe-inspiring, and that will nurture and build personal discovery and open-ended learning. Jack is uh, severely dyslexic and, and visual and auditory communication is fundamental to him for sharing his own ongoing journey to understand the lives of dinosaurs. He's also an excellent writer. As for myself, a few years ago, I chaired live sessions, uh, live sessions for an annual museums conference in Europe. Uh, the ongoing theme for three years uh, in a row was female empowerment in the context of women who worked in the museum and science center fields. To prepare, I read some uh, really interesting research articles on young girls falling off the STEM cliff and how girls wanted to be mentored and empowered to succeed in the sciences. This information and the fact that I have granddaughters really got me thinking. Uh, I have four of those granddaughters actually. Uh, there was a discovery made by a rancher in central Montana in 1979. And the bones that were found turned out to be baby femur bones, bones of what was later named Myasaur pilosaurum, which means good mother lizard. Next slide, please. Oh, no, sorry. Thank you, Amanda. Could you go back? Thanks. Sorry. That's me jumping ahead. Uh, the hypothesis Jack made after years of research was that the dinosaur was a nurturing and caring parent who fed her hatchlings in the nest until they were strong enough to survive on their own. Uh, this turned out to be a highly significant hypothesis and much was written about it. At, at the time, uh, Jack also co-authored a book called Maya, a Dinosaur Grows Up, which very quickly became a family uh, favorite. I'm told that there's more known about the Mayasaura than any other dinosaur on the planet and research by many scientists continues at Egg Mountain today. Next slide, please. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, Jack Corner has long understood uh, that the questions kids ask about dinosaurs, as he says, they are always the best questions. Um, so uh, for children uh, ages three to eight years old, the book is about dinosaurs. Uh, you can go to the next slide. The, uh, the book is about dinosaurs, of course, friendship, science, and fantasy time travel. And we hope that it'll be a STEM must read for parents as a read aloud book, like Amanda used it, uh, and also highly engaging for young readers. Next slide, please. 
Uh, we are very grateful to Karen Peterson of uh, NGCP for her wonderful endorsement of the book, which you'll actually see here on the, on the right, but it's quite small. So if you don't mind, I'll read it. Uh, Lily and Maya is, highly en is a highly engaging story, which will energize and interest in STEM for all young people, but especially for girls who will be able to see themselves in Lily's journey. I'm looking forward to sharing this wonderful resource with the thousands of programs served by the National Girls Network. Next slide, please. Uh, and we're also so pleased to have been able to publish um, the uh, identical version of the book, but in Spanish. Ole. <laughs> uh, I, I chose this young artist to work with us on telling Jack's story. Uh, Grace uh, Hattrup is her name, and she's now a sophomore in art college in Vancouver. Um, and, and actually worked on these beautiful illustrations part-time while she was still a senior in high school uh, during the pandemic uh, here on Bainbridge Island in Seattle. Uh, a few years ago, I read in a local paper that Grace won the Youth Art Award and her winning painting was very similar in style to this one of, Li of Lily reading about dinosaurs in her bedroom. This was the first time Grace had worked with a scientist to ensure the accuracy of the images in the book that portrayed Maya and the environments, including the fora, uh, correctly uh, from a scientific perspective. Um, we're delighted that a young woman who is developing her own career as an artist um, has also been such a great member of our team. Next slide, please. Uh, the first sentence in the book reads, hi, my name is Lily and I'm a paleontologist. She is not aspiring to become a paleontologist one day. She feels like she is one. Convincing her parents that she hoped to find some myosaur nests in Montana like Jack Horner had done, which she found out about by going to local museums, Lily was trusted to set up her little camp in the Badlands by herself. And she didn't feel lonely or scared at all. And of course, she came prepared with all the tools she would need for her scientific field work. Everything carried safely in her backpack. Next slide, please. Uh, no mistake, the chirp had footsteps now, which were definitely getting closer. The step stopped just outside my tent door and there was a different sound now, a cooing sound, almost like the cooing of a baby. Lily's curiosity and strong science identity kept her going and resulted in some amazing discoveries of her very own. Next slide. This is probably one of my favorite images from the book. Uh, as you can tell from the quality, this is a, a, a scan of the original artwork rather than the kind of cleaned up digital print work from the book. Um, I find it really beautiful and very touching. Lily said, I stepped up to the baby dinosaur and asked, can I touch you? The baby just cooed and stayed very still while keeping her eyes on me. Wow, your skin is bumpy, but really soft. Yes, this is one of the many science facts in the book, which I will hi highlight to you in the moment, in a moment. Sorry, a next slide. Uh, this is Lily, and most importantly, Lily is an example of a girl who has many qualities who other girls and boys will admire, and I hope, um, and I hope be inspired by, especially, especially her passion for science. The cave was dark, but I could see rays of light further ahead, and Maya started walking toward the light. I thought to myself, mom and dad probably wouldn't be too happy about me doing this but I just have to see where Maya is going. This is much too important for paleontology. This book is indeed fiction, but maybe unusual in the fact that there are so many non-fictional aspects uh, within it. Next slide, please. And Lily took it all in. I just stood there and stared. Oh my gosh, this is so awesome. And my friend Maya cooed back at me. And true to form, she later told her mom, in just this one day, I think I discovered evidence that Dr. Jack Horner was wrong about how close together myosaur dinosaurs nested from one another. Lily is observant, confident, creative, and definitely acts like a scientist. There are strong science fact teaching points embedded in the story that cover four areas. What is the field of paleontology about? How is field research in paleontology done? 
what is a myosaur and, and how was it found? And what is a myosaur nesting ground? Next slide, please. Um, we've received some great reviews so far from a range of educators and, and museum professionals and, and children's book authors as well. Uh, one very exciting testimonial is from Dr. Scott of PBS's Dinosaur Train, the popular, uh, as many of you probably know, PBS TV show for young children. Scott is also the CEO of the California Academy of Sciences and actually did study with Jack Horner too. Uh, interestingly, Scott highlights the fiction and nonfiction aspects of this book and does a great job of endorsing that this story is guaranteed to spark imaginations. Next slide, please. Lily and Maya Dinosaur Adventure is aptly dedicated to Dr. Holly Woodward Ballard, who earned her PhD from Montana State University, uh, where she studied under the supervision of Jack uh, Horner. She is a research associate at Oklahoma Museum of Natural History and the Museum of the, uh, the Rockies and an honorary associate of Museums Victoria. I was really uh, keen before we started this project to interview women working in paleontology about their interest in dinosaurs. Um, perhaps even from early childhood, uh, as I was trying to inform the character of Lily. Um, Holly's story could not have been more exciting to me as it, it, it just perfectly fit what I thought would be the ideal Lily character to send many kinds of messages to young children, and especially by setting an example for other young girls. Holly explained uh, to me that staying in science was a bit of a struggle um, due to lack of mentors and not being taken seriously by some teachers. Um, but she forged on and today is a highly valued scientist making exciting contributions to the field of paleontology. Next slide, please. Um, thank you so much for the time to tell you all a little bit about Lily and Maya Dinosaur Adventure and why and how it actually came about. Uh, we very much hope to particularly engage more girls in the wonderful world of natural sciences and encourage them to stay there with lifelong passion. Um, now, a uh, lifelong passion like Holly has. Um, now I'm delighted to introduce you to uh, Dr. Holly Woodward Ballard, who we are also pleased to meet today. Holly will be followed by Alyssa Barr, a science specialist, as I said before, in case anybody new is joined. Uh, she's the science specialist at the University Child Development School here in Seattle. And she will share some great ideas on how to use a book like this to engage both boys and girls in the classroom. Over to you, Holly. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really so honored to be part of Lily and Maya. And I'm really excited to share with you all how paleontology shaped my life. And in particular, talk about how dinosaurs have inspired my love of science and learning, especially from a young age, and how I feel that Dinosaurs are STEM's biggest ambassadors. So how did this all start? Um, I really don't remember. Uh, I think some of my earliest childhood books were hand-me-down dinosaur books from my dad. And from a really, really young age, I was already in the backyard in North Carolina digging up dinosaurs, or so I thought. Um, and as, you know, as soon as I could hold them up or steady, they were some the first things that I actually started uh, drawing as a kid. And so this is how it started. I don't even remember the stuff, but uh, that's what they tell me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, going on to grade school, teachers start asking you, what do you want to be when you grow up? And my answer was always, I want to be a paleontologist and study dinosaurs. And uh, I think my parents recognized this from, you know, way back when, really were excited and encouraged me to study dinosaurs and science and uh, took me as often as they could to this small museum in, in Greensboro, North Carolina, so I could see this guy. Um, this is a, a life-size model of T-Rex and, you know, um, being able to see like the flesh, fleshed out thing instead of just a skeleton of a dinosaur, I think really inspired me when I was a kid. And I would just go and stare at this thing for hours it seemed like, um, and here's a picture of me staring at this T-Rex, and I guess I did my best thinking with my hands on my hair, I don't know, um, but, you know, this would be what I would do, this science museum, just stay in this one dinosaur room, and so going through grade school and, uh, you know, especially high school, teachers really didn't know what to do with me, counselors didn't know what to do with me, I was the kid who liked dinosaurs, and um, no one else around me had this dream 
uh, teachers either didn't know how to help or thought it was just a phase. Um, my parents did everything they could. They would take me to the local library so I could check out, you know, the five dinosaur books that were in nonfiction um, as often as I could. Um, they would, you know, let me go to, uh, uh, they let me see the Discovery Channel as much as I, I wanted, and, and they would take me to local or, or regional museums. And so it wasn't a phase. I never grew out of it. And um, I just kept trying to figure out how to pursue my dreams. Um, when I was trying to go off to college and, and figure out where I wanted to go, that was back when the internet was still sort of in its infancy as far as search engines went. So it was even really hard for me to figure out what I should major in in college to, to pursue this dream. But I was really excited. Finally, after getting through undergrad, I, I got to go off to grad school. And this is where I finally got to study, focus in on dinosaurs. And this is about the time um, when I started to feel like I, I was actually a paleontologist because, you know, there's not much field or badlands in North Carolina to go dig in. So uh, when I was doing my research in Big Bend National Park in Texas, you know, I got to dig up dinosaurs and it's sort of hard to see, but there at, at my feet in this image is a dinosaur leg bone. Um, it's in pretty bad shape, but, you know, this was a fossil and I was so excited because this is one of the first things I'd ever found. Um, so that really just, you know, kept encouraging me um, to, to keep exploring and to keep studying dinosaurs. And I eventually got to present my master's thesis research at an international conference on paleontology. And again, during this time period, this is about when I started feeling like I belong somewhere. I went to this conference and oh my gosh, there were hundreds of people that were just like me, super excited about paleontology, super excited to share their research. And, you know, I, I realized that, you know, I'm not alone in this handful of people that I was aware of that, that liked paleontology and dinosaurs. There were so many people that I could network with and collaborate with at this conference. And so I, I go to it as often as I can still, and it's just an amazing experience. But after I got my master's degree, it was time to go on to my PhD at Montana State. And this is where I got to know Jack Horner, and um, he was my advisor for my PhD project. And I like to show this picture because this is Jack surrounded by his former graduate students in the Egg Mountain. That's where uh, a lot of my sort of fossils come from. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't really know Jack before going to Montana State. During my master's thesis, I realized I wanted to study dinosaur bone microstructure. And Jack is a, a pioneer in that field. So, you know, if I wanted to study this, I, you know, reason I need to learn from the best. So at one of these international meetings, I remember going up to Jack and at, at that point, I'd only really seen him on the Discovery Channel. So I went up to him and the conversation was something like, hi, my name is Holly and I want to study dinosaurs with you and be your student. Um, very starstruck, but he encouraged me to apply and I ended up uh, studying paleontology with him. And it was then that I really started to learn about my Asura and also making the slides that I realized that I like to ride dinosaur model. So it is a theme. I have many more pictures like this, but um, this is where I really started to learn about my Asura. I known about my Asura because it's among the pantheon of dinosaurs that I studied, you know, growing up as a kid. But this is where I actually started to realize how important and special this dinosaur was. And Jack had encouraged me to start uh, my dissertation project trying to learn more about this particular dinosaur. And uh, like uh, we've talked about earlier, um, Myasaura, most of the fossils come from this area popularly known as Egg Mountain in Montana, and in particular from this bone bed where thousands of Myasaura fossils have been found. And uh, it's been excavated for 40 years. We're still finding more uh, Myasaura bones there. So it gives a really good sample size to study, um, especially because fossils are usually so rare. So I was really honored to pick up where Jack and his colleagues had sort of left off on the research on Myasaura. And 
uh, with my research, I got to look at the bone histology or microstructure of a growth series of myosaur leg bones, so from babies to adults. And some of the things I learned, I was able to confirm that it only took myosaurus about eight years to get to adult size. And we discovered that myosaurus started laying eggs around three years old and uh, many more uh, aspects in my uh, dissertation work. But um, it, this research and the research that Jack and his colleagues have done have, as Audrey said, made myosaurus the most well-known of any dinosaur as far as its life history goes. And that's why my story should really be the poster child for dinosaurs in general. That's just my opinion, but it's an amazing dinosaur. Um, so after doing this research, I, I defended and got my PhD. And again, this is another step where I really felt like I had made it. I'm now Dr. Paleontologist Holly. And so this is, uh, of course, a picture of me and Jack on graduation. And they're my parents, Ron and Pam Woodward who were there literally from day one supporting my dreams. And so this was a really great day for me, but you know, now what? Uh, what in the world can you do with paleontology as far as a career? And this is something I never really thought about growing up and I didn't really know what my options were, uh, but paleontology provides unique employment opportunities. It's really amazing to think about, but in order to study dinosaurs or anything else that's extinct, you have to understand the world around you. You have to understand biology. You have to understand ecology, geology, all of these different fields. And so you have to study these things in depth in order to make inferences about the environment the dinosaurs lived in, for example, or how dinosaurs lived themselves. And so, I mean, all of these STEM fields that you're, you know, variety of them can be used to study paleontology. Even something like a statistician, we need to understand ecological modeling for dinosaurs. So a statistician could do that. Um, a physicist could figure out how dinosaurs moved or how their bite force was um, So all of these interesting fields can be applied to paleontology. And even uh, these people that are in these fields might not actually consider themselves paleontologists. But researchers reach out to these folks and say, we need your expertise to study dinosaurs. And so even for just a little bit, these folks can be paleontologists and participate in that research. And so I ended up getting a lab at a university at Oklahoma State University uh, to, to continue, continue studying dinosaur bone microstructure and looking at uh, this tissue through a microscope. And uh, that was really exciting, but I'm actually employed also to teach. Um, and I'm actually employed to teach at a medical school, Oklahoma State University Center for Health Sciences. And I teach medical students human anatomy and uh, help instruct them in the cadaver dissection lab. So it really seems weird that these two things could come together and, and work. But again, in order for me to understand what I wanted to study, dinosaurs and histology, I had to study this stuff in the modern world. And so especially for anatomy, usually if you're going to study anatomy, the, the of course, the most well-known subject for that are, are humans. So I studied a lot of human anatomy to get at questions about paleontology and am uh, well qualified to instruct anatomy for, for med school. So um, this is just all to say that there's so many fields that are open to paleontology. Um, no one is just a paleontologist. They have to understand the world around them to be a paleontologist. Um, another thing I didn't realize growing up wanting to be a paleontologist is that paleontology can show me and has shown me the world. And I'm not just talking about field work in different countries because you see that on the Discovery Channel, but um, I've gotten to meet so many people and be exposed to so many cultures. Um, you know, I've, I've seen dinosaur footprints in Spain, gotten to work with uh, study fossil dinosaurs in Australia, study fossil whales in Egypt, and look for dinosaurs in Mongolia. Most recently, I was an invited researcher for three months in Paris and got to work with this uh, research group. And I'm really, uh, really proud to uh, be officially a part of that group. But um, so it was great going to all these places, but the cultures that it exposed me to and 
you know, these, these different experiences, meeting people with uh, different backgrounds. I really never thought about that or expected that to really broaden my mind and open my mind to the world around me. And it's just so exciting that there's this common thread in all of these countries. They're paleontologists. There are people that love fossils. And so that sort of binds us together no matter, you know, trends and cultures. And so it was just an exciting thing to realize that there's this other part that paleontology does for me and for other people. Um, and so now that I really feel like I'm here, I'm successful, I really want to play it forward. And I say play rather than pay because I, I really feel like I'm just still playing. This is all fun for me. And I want other people to have experiences that maybe um, I didn't get to as a kid or, or growing up. So I lead excavations to Egg Mountain to dig up more dinosaurs, more myosaur to study. Uh, on the left is some pictures of my graduate students, one of which did study myosaur for his PhD. Um, also, med students will occasionally volunteer in the field, so they get to apply their medical knowledge to um, learn about dinosaur anatomy. On the right, the, the guy in black there, he started to dig with us when he was 16, and now he's almost uh, finished with his undergraduate work in paleontology at Montana State. And most recently, I've been working with an Egyptian group, um, a growing paleontology program out of Mansoura, Egypt. And uh, my role is to bring students from this group into my lab and teach them paleontology so they can then go back to this group in Egypt and train paleontologists there. So I've been really lucky to have one individual student uh, come and train with me for six months now on histology. And he went back and he's been training students in the lab in Egypt, but I'm really excited to say that I've been able to find partial funding for him to start his PhD next year, um, actually this fall in my lab. So I'm really excited about that. Um, and then I just wanted to finish up saying the key to all this for me is someone in my corner and for me that was my parent. Um, they always said I could do this. I think kids start out liking dinosaurs and um, they're told that they, they can't be a paleontologist or, or they should study something else, but I never was. And I'm not saying that every kid that likes dinosaurs is going to grow up to be a paleontologist, but I feel like dinosaurs are the ambassadors. They're the gateway to science. And if you can start by encouraging kids' interest in dinosaurs, they might not continue with that, but they might go off in, into some other STEM field just because dinosaurs got them in the door. Um, and then lastly, I just want to say that um, my parents were always there for me, but then academically, Jack is just a huge influence. He was my advisor. Um, I owe so much to him about how I think about science and think about um, just asking questions and thinking about things critically. So I'm really grateful to have had that opportunity to work from him. I've got so much more to learn. Um, this image is uh, Jack and I at Egg Mountain during sunset. We're probably talking about the next Mayasora project in that image. But um, thanks for listening to me tell you about my story. Um, next up, you'll hear from Alyssa Barr. She'll be sharing ideas for integrating science in the classroom. Holly, thank you so much. I sure feel um, honored and privileged to be one of those teachers that's in Students' Corner. And I think that that's such an important part of education and also that integrated learning is such a big piece of um, that science is in so many different parts of everything that we do and, and, and what we see every day. So making it very hands-on for students. Um, again, my name is Alyssa and um, I work at a, a independent school in Seattle and UCDS really has three specific programs. We have an infant toddler program, a preschool through fifth grade um, and a graduate school with an MED program. And thematic curriculum and rich and diverse literature really play an integral role in the education at UCDS. Um, you know, we might not necessarily always be able to go places, but books can bring an experience to our students. And it's really the job of teachers to create these real life learning experiences that integrate across subject areas. So students can see how subjects are interconnected and how as a scientist, you also wanna hone your math skills or your art skills. And that, that can come to play in lots of different areas as they grow. Um, and really we feel like sometimes it just takes one book to hook students into learning. 
Um, so if we head to that next slide, you'll really see how um, Lily and Maya Dinosaur Adventure provides rich text with facts. Um, and a setting that engages students for hand-on learning. And I'd love to share with you um, a classroom example of how you can create an immersive hands-on experience. And for us, this happened to be an archeological dig. Lily and Maya wasn't out yet, but we're gonna get to it because it was such an amazing gateway for more learning. Um, but here, it could easily be transformed into a dinosaur dig. And years ago, we actually did do a dinosaur dig and teachers were boiling, um, cow bones and we put them in in bins and children got to excavate those. So this fall, our preschool through kindergarten students um, conducted this archeological dig and the key was really in the preparation. So it's listening to those big ideas, hearing what students think, hearing about who they are as individuals and what they believe in and what they're excited about and fueling those passions. So we took a walk through our school to look for a place that we could practically do some digging. Um, we had lots of big ideas like through the floor um, in the science lab and maybe in the potted plants. Um, and then we found a little patch of soil back behind our library. And um, this is this became our dig site and it really was a location that fueled the motivation for students to want to dive into this learning and um, as a classroom teacher or an educator anywhere it takes a little innovation and creativity to think about how you could bring this kind of experience to students but the idea is um, anything can be become a dig um, you can do it in plastic bins, planter boxes, um, a patch of soil on playground, or even a little spot on a sidewalk. Um, and that they all can function as a dig site. And you can layer materials in a bin and even bring that bin to a student's desk. All right, as we head to that next slide, the physical preparation of a dig is just as important as the preparation that students need to prepare in that dig. So this is a time to build them up, to talk about what you can do and how you're going to engage in that process. Um, you know, listening to Holly talk about needing people in her corner, this is something we can do for all students. We can make this accessible for them. Um, we can show them characters and scientists like Holly who've done this and who can can be these um, these these idols to to watch and move forward and strive tr strive to be like and become those people for for other students. Now, um, in the classroom, we really started exploring tools. Um, you know, Lily comes completely prepared with her backpack of everything she needs. So we used hula hoops as our transects and students really um, worked in research teams. They practiced handling shovels and trowels, rakes and brushes, sieves. Um, and this is a time where they can start to think about what resources they can use from home. What could you use as a tool? Sometimes even a stick helps us get down into the earth. Um, sorry, we've got some, some road noise out there. <laughs> um, so this preparation really allowed for the investment and focus when practicing these um, skills in the field. It's really nice to give students an opportunity to work together as a team, to practice that communication. You know, we talk a lot in the science lab about how science doesn't really go anywhere unless you share it. So in that moment, as you're working and you're building and you're discovering things that you're talking about it with your fellow scientists. All right, if we head to that next slide. Um, once we built those strong field research teams, we headed out into the field and students prepped their material just like Lily getting ready to go into the Badlands. Um, and through our excavation, scientists really were practicing observation skills and problem solving, using analytical thinking skills, and really all of these happen under the umbrella of collaboration. And these feel like the foundational tools scientists need as they move forward on their educational journey um, and thinking about where they want to do and what they want to discover and what they want to study in the future. So with each new discovery our students had, new questions arose. Um, and if we head into that next slide, we, we brought all of our discoveries back into the lab and we dove into these questions, um, adding depth to students' understanding, while also taking time to document learning. That just because you find something doesn't mean the work is done. So here you kind of get into the nitty gritty of what it is that you're discovering. We use plastic bins to wash and sort each item. Um, it's, 
it shouldn't be surprising, but it is so surprising when you give kids a bin of water and a toothbrush, the fun that they have and how they notice details and they start to find different ways to sort things. And one group of students may sort by color, but another group might sort by shape and then another group might sort by size. And so having these cross collaborative conversations really starts to help children understand there are a lot of different ways that you can enter in an approach um, in a scientific observation and, and discovery process. So then from there, students get to practice scientific drawing by selecting one artifact to sketch with detail, color, and texture. Um, and teachers really are a big part of this recording process. You know, we often model new strategies. Um, we talk about labeling. And then we also really do a lot of dictation to ensure that their big ideas are recorded and that they can reflect back on their big discoveries. Uh, now, students did a lot of data collection, and so we really work hard to document that and help students understand what it is that they're seeing and, and why they're seeing it and where those trends are in data. And so we created a bar graph of each item collected, and then they worked as a community to bring the data together in one big graph. Um, and this is a time where you really are doing that cross integration of subjects where um, students get to use those math skills and they group by tens, they skip count, they're using addition facts and practicing interpreting the data, thinking about using terminology like less than or greater than. And depending on your age group, you can really give them a much bigger range of data sets and they can do some really deep thinking around what they're seeing in their scientific discoveries. And then finally, each child really got to select an artifact um, and they used the data we collected and questions posed to um, explore and stare, share a story about the artifacts that they found. Um, they were able to share this story with a peer and then take that story and artifact home so these stories can continue. And then if we pop to the next slide, you know, really exploration and play. I love that Holly says playing it forward because I feel I personally have always felt like science has been the fun that I've had in my life. Um, for me, it's marine science and that wonderful world of the intertidal zone and seaweed and limpets. Um, I just I spent my life playing and those were the, my biggest discoveries. Um, and this opportunity to explore archaeology naturally fed in to curiosity about paleontology with our students. And at this point in our studies, Lily and Maya was out for release, so we were able to read it with our whole class. Um, and this sparked us to order fossil kits from the Aurora Fossil Museum in North Carolina. And so students then got to transfer their knowledge from their archeological dig right into using tools and sorting the fossils they found from these kits. Now, Lily and Maya also helped inspire watercolor landscapes and dinosaur portraits inspired by new ideas about how colorful dino dinosaurs were thought to be. And in social studies, they really explored maps. Um, they were highlighting areas where they might find a denser concentration of dinosaur fossils and why there might be less and why and connecting that to the rock cycle. And in writing, students really pretended to be Lily. They wrote postcards from the site describing her finds. Um, and daily experiences. It was a great way to tie in social emotional learning. What might she be feeling like when she's out in that tent in the middle of the night and she's hearing sounds? Um, really talking about that experience. Now, other grades explored writing riddle poems, um, even and, and then getting to reveal a different dinosaur to their peers. And our youngest learners created a packing list with items for a trip that paired with writing paired writing with math to explore how many items they were bringing with them on their adventure. So Maya really inspired an increase in nonfiction reading about paleontology and dinosaurs and the people in the field, um, and even looking at future careers. And so we just really believe that learning can be both engaging and deep when you bring characters like um, Lily and Maya to life. So here at UCDS, we'd like to say a big thanks to Lily and Maya for all the fun that they've given us this, this school year. Well, thank you. I'd like to say a big thanks to our three speakers, Audrey, Alyssa, and Holly. I learned so much from hearing the three of you speak, and I come away very inspired um, to further my own learning about paleontology.
as well as to be that person in the corner of the students and my own children. Um, and, and this idea that we don't have to be the expert of something that our students are interested in. We can play and learn alongside them. I find that to be deeply inspiring as a parent and educator. So thank you three so much. I'm sure that many people in our audience have questions to ask. And I saw one question that came in earlier. So I'm going to ask that first, and then I'll browse through the chat a little bit deeper. So earlier, someone asked if, Holly, if you have written any kind of an autobiography, or if there's any place where students can learn more about you. Oh, um, that was kind of my autobiography attempt, the first one. But um, there is actually an educational module on um, this website called EL Education. I think it's a second grade module for um, you know earth sciences and uh, like the rock cycle and that, and that sort of thing. Um, but it they the people interviewed me about my dig site and you know about my Asora and, and my work in the field. So that's probably the closest to an autobiography um, or biography that I've written that's out there already. Thank you. Okay, we have lots of people are really interested to learn more from you, Holly. We have another question. Is paleobotany a separate field from paleontology? And then this person also asked, what kind of scientists study ancient animal fossils such as mammoths? Oh, that's a great, great question. question. Yeah, um, so paleontology actually encompasses um, the, that's like sort of this umbrella term. It's um, the study of ancient life. So paleobotanist would be a specific field within paleontology where you study uh, fossil plants. Um, and someone who studies something like uh, like mammoths or is also a paleontologist. Uh, they might consider themselves a, a mammal paleontologist, a paleomammologist, um, but they're, they're part of our group. Thank you. And then I had a question that came up earlier. Alyssa, can you tell us how paleontology and books like Lily and Maya fit into the science curriculum or the science standards that educators are trying to address during, I believe, the elementary school age was the question. Sure. Um, next generation science standards really allow for a lot of flexibility in the way that you get to bring experience to your students. So instead of teaching a specific um, topic or subject, you get to create more of an experience for students. And in that, they're going to hone and curate a lot of the skills that they need to tackle problems. They're going to learn how to problem solve. And along their, the way, they're going to be exposed to many different interdisciplinary um, and different areas of science. So Lily and Maya can come in at any point. If you want to study paleontology, think about, are you going to study life cycles? Are you going to think about, um, you know, like you could dive into the rock cycle. There's so many, you could talk about land formations. There's it, so many, I mean, science is so interconnected. So it's a really exciting opportunity to think about where do weathering and erosion, um, it's all of these amazing topics that you can tie in together and think about how can you make a real life experience for students that they feel like they can be immersed in. So that way learning becomes a little bit more authentic. Thank you. I think that's really helpful to think about that integrative piece and how this or any science topic that students are interested in could really fit in there. Um, we also had a question, Holly, could you talk about, this is a question directly from Audrey, a comment that you once made, uh, we need to understand the past in order to understand the present. What did you mean by that? What can we all take away from that quote? Um, I don't remember saying that, but I'm pretty pleased that I did. <laughs> um, it's, it's sort of circular, I know, but, um, you, you know, we have this, literally billion year old uh, earth history record. And um, the things that are happening now, especially with accelerated uh, global warming, uh, we can actually look in the fossil record and look at events that uh, led up to that same or similar thing uh, in the past. And we can learn from that what kind of animals went extinct, for example, um, and what made it through to sort of, in this example, a uh, focus on conservation and what animals we might be worried about you know, with this uh, global warming and which might just get by fine. So um, that's one specific example, but you, you sort of have to look at the present 
and understand the world around you, apply that to history, and then you can start reading that rock record, reading the fossil record, and then realize what that story is telling you, and then apply it back to the present and the future. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, last question, maybe for all three of you, aside from Lily and Maya, which I know we're all going to find that link Nancy put in the chat and get our own copies today. What is your other favorite book or movie or TV show to inspire young children uh, to learn more about dinosaurs? What do you think about some of the programs that are out there? Do you have one that you recommend? I do. <laughs> uh, I, uh, my, my youngest granddaughter is now seven, but I started watching uh, Dr. Scott's Dinosaur Train um, when she was about three, and I, I couldn't believe the colorful dinosaurs and, and, and the this, this science behind the show. I really loved it. Uh, and she loved it. So, and I think a lot of kids love it. So that's a really great example of uh, something really fun and engaging for really little ones, but that has a lot of authentic science behind it. So that's my favorite. I love Dinosaur Train too. I'm glad you you endorsed that show as well. Holly or Alyssa, any other thoughts? Or do you also like Dinosaur Train? Gosh, I wish I could remember the name of the board book, but someone gave it to us and it's a, it's a big thick one and it's got reveal and it goes through all different types of dinosaurs. And my daughter requests it almost every night. It's one of her most favorites. And um, you can see the progression of dinosaurs through time and you, they give scale and their silliness in there. And then at the end, it talks about extinction and it's, it's, it's a beautiful book and I'm, I'm going to try to think of it, but that's one of our favorites. I'll have to look for that one for my daughter. How about you, Holly? Any, any last um, thing, maybe for adults, it seemed like there was a lot of adults in here wanting to know questions about paleontology and paleobotany and all these great fields. Uh, any favorite movies or resources for grownups? Um, actually, there's a book that just came out called Dinosaur World that um, actually uh, a master's former master student of, that I was on the committee of actually wrote and collaborated with a paleo artist on. And I think it sort of, I'm not trying to plug it, but it, it sort of uh, transcends both children and adults because it's sort of on that level where both can understand. There's the, the imagery is really great for any age kid, but then there's information there that's really useful for people trying to learn about dinosaurs and, and learn about paleontology. Awesome. Well, I'll have to check that out. Thank you for that suggestion. Thank you to all three of you for the resources, ideas, and strategies that you shared. We would love to know what you're going to take away after this webinar. What will you be doing with your own children or students or programs that you serve? Um, will you be checking out one of these books, maybe some of the materials that Alyssa suggested? Please share in the chat and share with us on social media. Nancy can pop in our NGCP social handles because we'd love to continue the discussion. And maybe when Alyssa finds out the name of that book, I can share it or we can share it and we can continue this great dialogue and resource sharing that we've had today. I want to thank Audrey, Alyssa, and uh, Holly one more time for sharing your personal stories, your experiences, and your expertise with us. We certainly learned so much from all three of you. If you enjoyed this webinar, we hope you'll come check out some of our upcoming events. We're doing a screening and conversation around the documentary Fire of Love, and there was a lot of great talks about children's books today. So if you're interested in learning more and talking about breaking stereotypes through children's books, please sign up for our April 27th webinar where we'll have authors and publishers coming to talk about how books can break STEM stereotypes. If you enjoyed this webinar and you enjoyed what we shared, consider supporting the work of the National Girls Collaborative Project. We'll put a link in the chat. And lastly, please take a few moments to complete our post-webinar survey. It really helps us guide the topics and resources that we share with you. We'll be sharing a recording, the slides, and all the links and information in the chat with all of you after the event is over. And once again, thank you to our speakers 
speakers. Thank you to all of the attendees and participants today for asking such great questions and interacting in the chat. Thank you for being here and take care. I hope to see you at the next event. Thank you very much.